Awesome. Are you guys ready for this? Pastor Andrew Stone. Let's welcome his stage to preach the Word of God. Hey, it's really nice to see you all. Thank you so much, worship team, for leading us the way that you did. I love being back here at Emerge. I had a great time with you this morning. Ali and I always say Emerge is our home away from home. So we get to sow into your lives in a deeper level. I'm not just a guest here, I feel like family. So tonight, as we embark on the journey of a deep dive into one of the famous miracles of Jesus, I want to expand or take a macro look at the miracle where Jesus walks on water and what it means for us here and now. Now, I want to preface this by saying whether you've been in faith for three seconds or 300 years, this should meet you where you're at. And here's why. Because this is a human sermon, not a Christian one. This is something that I believe if you would ever take this recording and show it to someone that is exploring faith, they'll be able to at least connect with some of it. The, the Bible and the, the, the stories of Jesus aren't just for Christians to be touched by. They're actually for the whole world because the Word of God says faith comes through hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Amen. So if you don't mind, we are going to go through Scripture. Quite a bit of it. But not in a way where you go, oh my gosh, the Bible. I'm a third generation Christian kid, I already know. But we're going to break it down bit by bit so that by the time you watch it, for some it'll be a seed tonight that in years you go, oh, that's what that meant. And for others, it's going to be, that's the word I needed today. For others, it'll be, I've never explored faith before, but you're going to be the friend that gives it to them because it's a human encounter with God. You guys ready to go? Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about calm in the midst of chaos. Who knows what that feeling's like when you go, I don't know what's going to happen next. You know, those stationery stores used to do quite well from us when they used to sell yearly planners. Not so much now. Because in the midst of chaos, the question will be, is where is God in all of it? Where is God in all of it? I have the privilege in what I do, not just preaching on Sundays, but in what we do with leaders locally and globally, is we work through people and work through their journeys when they're going through what you'd consider really challenging leadership anxieties, spaces in their mental health that aren't always the greatest for forecasting and future fitting. So what we do is we come into their space and we bring peace and calm in the middle of chaos. And so what do we do here now as we embark on this journey of saying, God, what does 2022 look like? Like this morning, we talked about having courage. But pre-courage I want to bring clarity and calm to what you might consider chaos. Because I don't want you to relive like what Pastor Joe said. Don't bring the chaos of 2021 into 2022. Realize that you have the power to bring calm in the midst of a circumstance. Because you and I are in covenant that's greater than our circumstance. So if anyone was ever having a bad day, like if you ever think you're having a bad day, sometimes it's just good to reflect and go, let me go read the book of Job. Right? It's not fair, God, I'm having a bad day. Go read Job. That's a bad day. You want to get perspective? Read Job. So Job writes this in Job 9, right? But he says something along the lines of this. Has anyone ever hardened their heart toward God and prospered? Like, have you ever fought God and won? 
God is wise and righteous in all ways. He can turn the mountains upside down if he wants to, just because he can. If you want to argue with God, you will lose a thousand to one, which is a euphemism for saying, don't try a thousand times to get your one. It's, it's Joe's way of saying, don't bother trying to argue with God because you'll lose if you've hardened your heart and you're stubborn toward him because he is God. And then he writes this phrase, if we can bring that up in Job 9. He writes this phrase, he alone stretches out the skies and walks on the waves of the sea. This is Old Testament. He walks on the waves of the sea. God is so powerful. He can turn mountains upside down. He can stretch out the skies, things that humans cannot do. And then he walks on the waves of the sea. Do you know that ever since my parents built their swimming pool, you know, 16, 17 years ago, every summer, I have tried. I'm not lying. I even try to make it spiritual. Close your eyes at the edge of the pool. You're like, if, if Peter can do it, he was just like me. And then you pray something maybe spiritual. Sometimes if you, if you grow up in it, you pray ugly. Because it makes it more spiritual. The ugly you pray, the more God hears you. Then you do the Pentecostal sway. And then you feel like you're in a prayer circle now. So it's like, tag, you're it. You pray next. Every time I put my foot on that water, I've fallen right in. I have a 100% fail rate. But I'm going to keep trying. It's one of the questions I'm definitely going to ask in heaven. Because for the record, there are only two people that have ever walked on water in all of human history. Jesus and Peter. Jesus and Peter. If, I mean, that's one of the questions I'm going to ask, at least when I get to heaven, unless by then I've somehow mastered it. <laughs> so Peter, what did it feel like? Well, let's jump into the story in Matthew 14. I want to break today down into three digestible postures, pain, perspective, and peace. Because it's a human sermon, not a Christian one. We all experience pain. We all need perspective. And every human being desires peace. They might not know it, but they desire it. They find coping mechanisms to find it. Pain, perspective, peace. It's easy for time. It's also easy to digest because you can break it up very easily. For those that will eventually watch this, this is a message for you. And this is what it says in Matthew 14. It says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read the story in Matthew 14, and then I'm going to bite-size it through the story, okay? But this is Jesus's introvert moment. All the introverts unite, and they're like, yes, but let's unite separately. It's like, I just want peace on the mountain. So if you're an introvert, you're like, oh, Jesus is like me too. He went up the mountain to pray by himself. And when he gets there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. If we get the next slide over. And when the disciples 
saw him walking on the sea. They were troubled saying, it is a ghost and they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. We have to pause there for a moment because this is that moment in the disciples' journey. After seeing multiple miracles, this is the moment where they drop to their knees and they say, truly, you are the son of God. The prequel miracle to this one is the feeding of the 5,000. That's a lot of people to feed more than the young adults retreat with leftovers. 5,000 men, most historians would say between seven and nine to maybe 10,000 people, including women and children were there. Five loaves, two fish, they fed the multitudes. The disciples never said that after that miracle. After feeding that, that, I mean, numerically, that's the largest miracle they'd ever witnessed. They never fell to their knees at the end of it saying, truly you are the son of God. They saw water to wine. Didn't say it. They saw multiple miracles and they never said that. What is it about this miracle that makes them say that? Truly you are the son of God. So let's talk about pain The ultimate equalizer for humanity is pain. A pandemic shows that. We now feel empathy for one another. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. They were in the middle of it. Like, when it says in the middle of the sea, it pretty much means that they were too far in to go back and they were too far in to see, the sh- to see the shore. Have you ever felt like you're in the middle of something? Like you can't just go back to what it was, but you don't know exactly what it's gonna look like. Welcome to the last two years of our lives. You can't go back to what it was, but you don't know exactly what it'll look like. They're in the middle of it. And then it says, tossed by the waves for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. You know, when you glance over something like now in the fourth watch, you're like, oh yeah, that's nice. The fourth watch was like three to 6 a.m. in the morning. we, We always say, man, if Jesus was here, we'd just love to be one of his disciples. I mean, sometimes it's just hard getting kids volunteers. I want to be one of Jesus' disciples. Come and serve kids. You can come at eight o'clock in the morning. Nah, that's too much. (laughs) Jesus, you want to be a Jesus disciple? He has you in a boat going across a storm at three o'clock in the morning. Do you really want to be a Jesus disciple? He works you hard. He's in there, fourth watch, and then it says, And Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. So in the middle of it all, in the middle of the chaos, in the middle of the pain that they they, they were right in, they cried out for fear, even though, because it says it is a ghost. They thought it was a ghost. Some would say spirit. Some would say apparition depending on the version you read. It means they were spiritually sensitive, but still fearful. So when you're in the middle of it, and we can watch this by the way we read social media and the articles that we read, and we watch the, 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 the temperature of humanity in their spirituality because we are looking for something spiritual. 
but you can still be spiritual and be fearful. So they're in the spirit, they're spiritually aware, but they're still fearful. And then it would say that they couldn't recognize Jesus. Now, if you are spiritual, but you don't see Jesus, you'll still live in fear. And this is why we're in the middle of it. We can be in chaos, we can be in disruption. And you can spiritually search as much and as long as you want. And for those that will eventually watch this recording, know this, that you can be spiritually aware, but if you don't have Jesus, you'll still live in fear. We can find, we can Google, we can, we can Facebook join groups that teach us this spirituality and that spirituality. But when we're in the middle of it, we need Jesus. This generation needs Jesus. We don't just need to be spiritual. I don't want to come up here and give you a spiritual chat where Jesus is an option. No, when you're in the middle of it and you're fearful, Jesus' perfect love casts out all fear, not your level of spirituality. And so when you're in chaos, God is used to it. Have you ever felt bad for being in chaos? Have you ever felt bad for feeling anxious? Have you ever felt guilty for not having it all together? Join the club. Right? You feel guilty and you, and, and you wrap your, how do I get out of it? And Jesus the whole time is like, I'm with you if you just let me. I'm used to your mess. Right from the beginning. Right from the beginning. Like I said, if I was running, if this was a movie, like if I was doing this as a whole movie, like Jesus walking on water, this is the moment where there would be a flashback scene to Genesis 1-2. Right, and this is what it reads in Genesis 1-2. It says, the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Sound familiar? God's used to being over chaotic waters. And so what, what happens is, is we read Genesis 1 and then 2 and we jump to 3 and we're like, yes, let there be light. That's the solution. We love that part because that's, where we go, yep, the darkness is done, let's get to the light part. But the prequel to let there be light is that God's not just interested in the solution, He's interested in being in the chaos with you. He doesn't just go, just fix yourself, I'm gonna fix you. No, 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 I'm going to feel something with you before I fix it. Meaning I'll be in and on the journey with you, your human journey. So the prequel of the great Genesis 1-3, if we were to re-look at it, looks like this. The word moved means to grow soft, upon means on account of, on behalf of, and waters means violence, emptiness, and instability. So if we were to rewrite that, it would look like the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God grew soft on behalf of and in the face of violence, emptiness and instability. That term violence doesn't mean like war or physical pain or altercation. It means lack of peace. So, he didn't just get angry with the chaos. He didn't just get angry with the darkness because God doesn't have an emotional issue. God doesn't have, uh, uh, he doesn't have that moment where he goes, wow, I didn't see that coming. So I'm gonna be angry about it. No, when there is chaos and there is violence and instability, it says that his heart grows soft on and in behalf of violence, emptiness, and instability. If you've ever felt that in your own soul, know that God is with you in it. And He feels something for you, not just wants to fix you. Because He's in the human experience like us. 
So he grows soft on it on behalf of violence, emptiness, and instability. God feels empathy for your journey. Which leads us then to perspective. Because if you remain in pain without ever looking for a God perspective, you will start justifying something inferior to your divine design and making the journey that you're in the ultimate goal. Whereas God wants to shift your perspective even in the midst of pain, which means you can acknowledge what you're going through, but you can agree that God has a promise over your life. So he shifts our perspective. So when God had an issue with darkness and violence and emptiness and instability, he didn't start a Facebook group saying how much he hated darkness. Darkness is bad. I hate darkness. I'm going to fight it. God doesn't fight darkness because it's not his equal. God doesn't have an equal. He just solves the problem but he feels and is in it with you first and then joins you on the journey of perspective. But let's jump into Matthew 14, where it says, but immediately Jesus spoke to them. Now remember, they thought it was a ghost and the ghost was now talking to them. They were spiritual, but they were in fear because it was a storm. So all their senses are heightened. They think they might die. And now they're seeing things. This is a bad day. And then Jesus doesn't speak to their fear necessarily. He says this, be of good cheer. I don't know why, but I do hear that in a British accent every single time. I don't know why. Do you hear? I think Julie, you'd hear it in a British accent because it's cheer. Like, yeah. Be of good cheer. It is I. That term, it is I, is the same phrasing that when God spoke to Moses and he says, I am. I I am, I am God. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There is no beginning, there is no end. I just am. And this is the God that says, I am, be of good cheer. Do not be afraid. In the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the fear, Jesus turns around and says, be of good cheer. Why is that? Because he doesn't have an equal and the chaos is not what he's fighting. He gives us the perspective shift right here to say you can be cheerful because of your perspective shift in the midst of chaos and fear. Be of good cheer. Why? Because I am. I was the God in the beginning that grew soft on behalf of and in the face of violence, emptiness and instability. And I said, let there be light. Darkness and chaos and emptiness and instability is not my equal. God has no equal. Like we would say the opposite of hot, cold, the opposite of black, white, the opposite of day, night. And then we'll say opposite of God, well, the devil. The devil's not the opposite of God. He was a created being. God is creator. He was created and he didn't even do his job description right. Be of good cheer. For some of us, that's just going to be encouraging to our soul. Be of good cheer. In the midst of the the, the chaos and the fear and the spirituality, and I think I'm seeing things, be of good cheer. I am. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. What did Jesus just say? Do not be afraid. But 
This is really intriguing in how it's written because it says that he saw that the wind was boisterous. You don't see wind. You don't see the wind. You experience and feel the wind. It's like the same, in, it's, it's like the Matthew's trying to give us this sensory experience and somewhat confusion. Like when uh, the, the older brother in the story of the prodigal son, it says that he was angry because he heard the dancing. You don't hear dancing, you see dancing. Have you ever felt something and attached a visual to it that wasn't true? All right, so you're swimming at the beach. You're out deep enough. I'm a faith-filled man and a pretty decent swimmer, but I still give Jaws options before he gets to me. You can swim as far as you want. There's gonna be at least seven people before he gets to me. You ever been swimming and something just brushed up against your leg? Just seaweed, people, just seaweed. And what do you think? You're gonna be part of Jaws 5. <laughs> yes, there are four Jaws movies. It's really bad, the fourth one. It's called Jaws the Revenge. I don't know why I have this obsession with watching shark movies and not liking them that much, but I watch them anyway. <laughs> Jaws Revenge is so bad that at the end, this is no spoiler alert because just don't watch it, but if you want to, go watch it. But I'm gonna tell you the ending. <laughs> it's so bad that at the end of the movie, they kill the shark. And all the people that he ate are alive and they come out. Yeah. I kid you not. But this is what I mean. It's a bad movie. It's an experience in itself. It's a bit like watching the first Sharknado, right? So, eh, which became a cult classic. So, have you ever felt something and attached a lie to it visually? So Peter had seen this kind of, a storm could whip up really easily on the Sea of Galilee. And most likely there'd been boats that were lost. Most likely he'd lost friends on that sea that, that, that had passed and perished in this. That's why they're afraid during these kinds of storms. I've seen a grown man, my cousin, who is tough as anything. He's the kind of guy you walk through the neighbourhood with that knows everybody because everyone's a little bit afraid of him. Right. And I remember once, grown man, walking through South Bank. And in the middle of it all, he walked through, you know, near that, there used to be like this temple looking thing near the, there's a garden and a whole thing. That's cool. But he walked through that part at night and he happened to walk through a spider's web. <laughs> I've never seen anyone lose their dignity so quickly. He was in between a kung fu movie and a ballerina all at the same time because he felt something and then imagined the size of the spider on him. Now, there was no spider. But you ever, I mean, you want to see a grown man do something stupid, have him walk through a spider's web when he doesn't know where the spider is. Why? Because when you feel something, you often attach a visual to it. And it's not always true. So let's catch the picture here. Peter is in the biggest miracle, the only miracle in humanity where he's it. No one else has walked on water except Jesus. He is literally in the middle of his miracle. And yet he had a feeling and attached a lie to it. Have we ever been, and I would say that across the last few years and even the year coming, there will be moments where we are right in the middle of our miracle, a miracle that other people wish they were in. And if we see something that we distracts us from the person of Jesus, or we feel something rather than look to Jesus, what happens is we attach a lie to what we're feeling that distracts us from the miracle we're in. He's literally in a once in a lifetime miracle. Hey, for this year, for 2022, I'm believing that you get some amazing supernatural miracles in your life. But 
hey, when you're in it, let's not get your feeling that leads us to visualizing a lie. Because you're not meant to see the wind. It's, it, does, it doesn't even say that he saw the wind whipping up waves. Because that's what would happen. He says that he saw that the wind was boisterous. Now he saw what could happen because he felt something. Let's not imagine. So let's, let, let me put it this way. He assumed the worst even though Jesus was right in front of him. And he was standing in a miracle. Let's not let the distractions and the assumption of the worst distract us from our miracle where Jesus is right in front of us. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt Remember, Jesus' heart grows soft on behalf of and in the face of violence, instability, and emptiness. He still saved him. And there are moments in our life where we will be distracted. There will be moments where our feelings overtake the Jesus standing in front of us. Yet in it all, he still rescues us because his heart is always feeling something for us. Let's keep reading. And then in Genesis 1-3, what does he say? Let there be light. Meaning there is darkness, there's emptiness, there's instability and lack of peace. Yet if you can see me, I will shift your perspective. Not just let there be light, but the, let the one who is light shine. When Genesis 1-3 was when the light came, it wasn't like the sun that our universe kind of, uh, that planets orbit around. They, the stars were created on day four. If you wanna watch more, just watch Louis Giglio's Indescribable. We have a sun that's a star and it's not even the biggest one. This was God saying, let the one who is light shine. Jesus is the one. John 1, 4 to 5 says, in him was the life and that life was the light of men. Watch this. And that light shone so brightly that darkness could not comprehend it. We don't fight darkness and we don't fight the chaos and we don't fight the circumstance or the emptiness or instability. No, we have a light that confuses it. Because the chaos sits under Jesus, it's never his equal. And if we keep that in perspective, it leads us to living a life of peace. All right, let's jump into peace. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of of God, the ancients believed that only God could control the waters. There was a Danish king called King Canute, and people lorded over him like he was a god. And so, what he did was he took his throne down to the ocean and he took all his advisors. He said, I am not God. And he, and he sat down and he put his throne and he, he, he commanded the waves to stop. And they just kept coming. And he says, see, I am not God. The ancients believed that only God could control the waters. So they said, truly, you are the son of God. Hey, you know what? When he said, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. It was at that point I would have assumed that the, the, the storm would have ceased. Notice it never did. Notice he said, be of good cheer. It is I, do not be afraid. And the storm just stayed. See, being of good cheer in the midst of a circumstance that means that you should be living in the opposite is an act of faith. 
It is an act of faith. To say no matter what the craziness is, no matter what the circumstances are, I am in a covenant where it is illegal for me not to be blessed. So I will be of good cheer. I will find, it, like I said this morning, it is easier to be negative and pessimistic and fatalistic than it is to have the courage to be bold and optimistic. It takes courage to see the best in the future that is ahead of you. So we want peace. This is something. And, and, and for those that are looking for that shalom peace, peace isn't the fact that everything's perfect in your life. Peace is having a posture to say that in the midst of it all, there is something that I anchor myself to that is bigger than all of it. It's the heightened perspective in the middle of something. Ezekiel 37 would say that we are given a covenant of peace, a promise of peace. The term is shalom. And if we look at it this way, we see that shalom is made up of four letters. And the four letters are pictures. And if we were to write these pictures out for you like hieroglyphics, a little bit like emojis. That is literally the first time I've ever called the Hebrew language emojis, right? But it's a little bit like that, a little bit like hieroglyphics. A picture represents something. So if we were to look at the four letters in Shalom, what you find is this. If we bring that up on the screen. The first is Shin, and it's it's of teeth, of sharp teeth, and it's of destruction. The second is Lamed, which is a shepherd's crook, and it means connected to or attached to. The third is Vav and, and, and it's nails. Sorry, Lamed means authority. The third is Vav and it means connected to or attached to. And fourth is waters. Now, what do we, what do we know about water? Right from Genesis 1-2, that it meant violence, emptiness, instability, chaos, or waste even. So when we look at the term peace and this covenant of peace in Ezekiel 37 that's promised to us, what does it really say? Shalom means destroying the authority attached to chaos. So when I say peace be with you, who's ever grown up in a church that was a bit more traditional? And they would say, pass the peace, right? And I grew up, like I said, I'd be like, okay, that's different. How do I pass peace? But you don't realize the sacredness of that moment is if I say shalom to you, if I say peace be with you, this is what I'm saying. We go like, peace, man. Like this is what I mean, spirituality A a, a spiritual peace means emptying oneself and hoping everything works out right. But a biblical peace is proactive. It's a posture of power that says, I have a promise that destroys the authority attached to chaos. Now I wanna talk to all the younger generation in the room. And if you wanna feel like you've jumped into that, jump into that yourself. Because age is nothing but a number. It's a mindset. I met some 18-year-olds that act like they're 75. I met some 75-year-olds that are ready to see what God can do with their life. So come on. If you take this into your life and you have a chaotic moment, you say, I have a promise of peace and I take authority right now that is attached to this chaos and through the blood of Jesus and the finished work of His resurrection, I destroy it right now in Jesus' name. This year, there will be moments of chaos that you feel that is uncontrollable, but you have a God that has no equal. You have a God that says, I have given you a promise of peace, a covenant of peace that destroys the authority attached to chaos. This is what it says in Psalm 77. The voice of your thunder was in the world when the lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was in the sea, your path in the great waters and your footsteps were not known. If we get the next slide over. Oh, actually, I skipped a whole thing. Can we just go back there? That one. The water saw you, O oh God. The water saw you and they were afraid. Yes. The chaos sees God and it's afraid. What were the disciples afraid of? What was Peter afraid of? The waters, the chaos, the disruption, the, 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 the uncontrollable nature of it all. Yet 
the waters are afraid of God. The chaos, the emptiness, the instability, the violence, the lack of shalom. The depths also trembled. The clouds poured out water. The sky sent out a sound. The arrows flashed about. Then your way was in the sea. Your path was in the great waters. God is above the chaos. He is above the waters. He is in it with you. It says right there, he is in the sea with us, but he's never under it or of it. He's on it, he's in it, and he's above it but he's never of it or under it because his peace is the peace that destroys the authority attached to chaos. So for all the thinkers out there, because this, this is a human story that for all of us. So if you're a thinker, if you're a feeler, you would have caught something today. But for the thinkers and the reflectors, I want us to go home and be able to say, name and define your chaos like, what do you feel chaotic about? Like, is it your job? Is it your health? Is it your family? Like, what's your chaos? I have a big enough family to tell you I've always got chaos in my family. What, what, what is your chaos? If you can't name and define it, it'll always control you. What is your chaos? I'm coaching you right now. What is your chaos? Name and define it, right? I'm going through a post-it note phase at the moment. Must be a working from home thing. I went through a post-it note phase at the moment. I'm being real. You, you write and name your chaos on post-it notes, right? And then you get a different color post-it note and you write the name of Jesus on it. This is visual because I'm a visual learner. And you take the name of Jesus and over every piece of chaos in your life, you just place it on top and you slap it down hard. Like you mean it. It's like, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. And every time you look at it, just remember who's above your chaos. Because when he walked on the water, it wasn't some cool miracle because Jesus didn't have anything better to do. He was saying, I am above it all because I'm the God that Job wrote about. I'm the God that David wrote about in Psalm 77. The waters are afraid of me. The chaos is. And in our lives, our chaos should be afraid of the Jesus that's in us. So name and define your chaos. Then write down what are, what are the controllable and uncontrollable factors in the chaos? What can I control and solve? What can't I? When the plane stopped, I couldn't travel. That's uncontrollable to me. I can't call the CEO of the plane, the, 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 the airlines, and be like, hey, you guys better fix yourselves. I can't do that. So I had to list them. And then this is what I did. is I had to worship. What did they do in the boat? They worshiped. They worshiped after they went, truly you are the son of God. What I could control, I fixed or attempted to. What I couldn't control, I said, God, I'm just gonna worship. I have no other option. I'm just going to worship. If I could have the worship team. Wasn't that a great segue? <laughs> Can I have the worship team up, please? Tonight, I wanna do an altar call, if that's okay. I'd love to pray for you if you feel a certain level of anxiety. I'd love to pray for you if you feel uneasy or chaotic in your own world. I'm not gonna ask you what, unless you feel to share and the team will, will respect that. But tonight, I don't want you to leave feeling like that chaos has authority over you. It doesn't belong in your kingdom life. So as these guys worship, they're gonna lift up the name of Jesus and you can see that name of Jesus over every part of your chaos. Jesus walked on water so that 2,000 years later, in the middle of whatever we call this chaos, we can know that he's still walking on our water, that he's still in charge. He is still the authority that destroys the chaos because the chaos fears Him. Would you stand up to your feet? I'm gonna pray a blessing over you. And as the worship team plays,
I'm going to ask you, if you want prayer for anything, if you want prayer for a space in your life where you feel it's uncontrollable or chaotic or lacks peace, even if you were to say today, I've never actually made a decision. I've never made a decision to allow Jesus to be the King and the authority in my life. I've tried to be spiritual, but I still live in fear. Let His perfect love today through a relationship with Him become your reality. You can do that today. What a great decision for the beginning of the year, no matter what your age is. You can just join us, every, everyone at the front later, and you just tell the person praying for you, hey, I made a decision today to let Jesus be my authority. And then they'll pray with you and they'll connect you with a whole group of people to get you on your journey. Maybe He was the authority once in your life and He walked away. That's okay. He was still in the chaos with you. And He wants to say, let me shine in your life.